Well, let's look at Revelation 21. I'll just start reading and then we'll talk about it. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names were written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three great gates on the east and three on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its walls. <clears throat> the city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod, fifteen hundred miles. Someone say something else in that one. 12, there we go. Twelve thousand furlongs, and its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its wall, 72 yards. Someone say something else there. Yeah, 144 cubits. I don't know why the NASB went and did that in a few of these spots. They got it right everywhere else. Um, according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements, the material of the wall was jasper and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And we'll go on into 22 in just a moment. But did we, did we already go over 21? Yeah, I thought we did. I thought we did. I just Maybe I'll just look over uh, just a little bit of review on that, and then we're going to go on into 22. But 21, as I think I said this last time, um, 21 is kind of one of those already but not yet. The, the new heaven and the new earth, there's aspects of this that are pointing to the future, and there's aspects of this that are happening even already right now. And so it's in the Bible, there's places in, in Revelation and other places, but there's this tension between what is already and what is not yet. Like we already have eternal life, and yet we have not yet arrived there in heaven. So there's an already not yet. And there's, there's different things like that in Scripture. This is one of them. <clears throat> part of it's, part of it's uh, in the future for sure. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven 
and the first earth passed away and there's no longer any sea. We, we know in uh, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, it talks about the earth and all that's in it being burned up at the second coming of the Lord. And, and this is not a, a new earth in the sense of a brand new planet or a brand new universe. It's a renewed earth and it's a renewed uh, heaven. We know that, uh, well, there's just by the Greek words here, but we also know even in uh, Romans chapter 8, it talks about the, nat the nature itself is groaning for the, the revealing of the sons of God. And so it, it's like um, there's going to be a renewing of this whole earth. And it says, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. There's a sense when this is future, uh, the bride adorned for her husband, there's going to be an adorn. the bride is the church, there's going to be an adorning that happens uh, at the return of Christ. When we're glorified, there's going to be the ultimate adorning. And yet, in a sense already, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. The, when Christ came, the very church of God came. The, there was already, in a sense, this, uh, the holy city coming down out of heaven. Uh, Christ started his kingdom. And the, and the bride has been here on the earth ever since. And uh, the church really is truly from God. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he, he will dwell among them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And, and there's a sense when, that, again, that is future, and yet it's right now. There's a sense already where uh, God is tabernacling among men. And when we saw the, the veil was torn in two, when Christ said it is finished, uh, the Bible says we all became, uh, all those who believe in Christ, that we are priests. We're a chosen people. Uh, we're in a, a holy priesthood. We all have access to God. God is tabernacling among men. And so here when we gather at church, uh, the, this, this as we read this morning, this, is, this church, like every other local church, is called the Church of God, and God's present. He's here. He's here in our hearts. And so God is already tabernacling among men. He's with us right now. And yet there's a sense in the future when it will be not by faith but by sight. And so there's an already and a not yet going on here. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and there'll be no longer any death or no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. First things have passed away. Again, that is, that is in a definite sense in the future when God will wipe away every single tear and no more death. And yet, even now, even now, while we still cry, there's a sense that God wipes, wipes away our tears right now. And there's a way, uh, when it says there'll be no longer any death, the, the Bible calls the, when a, a Christian falls, a, when the, a Christian dies, the Bible says it's asleep. In 4.13, 1 Thessalonians 4.13, it says, but I'll let you get there. I hear a few pages rustling. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 when we, when we talk about he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and there'll be no longer any death, in a, and that is de definitively true in the future. But even now, in 4.13, it says, but we do not want you to be an uninformed brethren about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. When, when the Bible talks about a Christian who has died, the Bible uses the word sleep. It, you know, that's really interesting, isn't it? It doesn't say we, we don't want you to be an informed brethren about those who are dead. It doesn't say that. It says those who are asleep so that you'll not grieve as the rest who have no hope. And so in, in a way there really is no more death among those who belong to Christ because the Bible, what does it say? When we die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so there's a very real sense when a Christian dies, they're immediately out of their body and in the presence of the Lord. And so, in, in, a, in a way, the <clears throat> death's already gone. I mean, we'll physically die, but I, I don't even know what a, I mean, none of us know until we experience it, but according to the Bible, it's just, our body just goes to sleep and our spirit's with the Lord immediately. And so, these things, there's an already and a not yet. And even the, the mourning, the crying, the pain, these things, I mean, we experience them now, but not even the same as someone who doesn't believe in fact, um, a, a Christian can be in mourning and can be in crying and can be in, in pain, and yet deep down in their heart of hearts, uh, even through all the tears, there's 
deep down inside, they still can have the joy of the Lord, even in the midst of their tears. They, they, and they have the hope. They have that sure hope of Christ. And so it's just, it's not the same. I, I think about, you know, the mourning and the crying and the pain, and I think about uh, someone without Christ. <clears throat> I, I just, I, it's hard to uh, imagine what someone like that uh, when they get old, when they get sick, when they have loss, you know, what what they do, what they go through. I remember years ago um, when my father-in-law was sick and in at Abbott Northwestern when he was, he was, uh, he had cancer at that time and we'd go down there and see him like almost every day and um, I just remember one fellow um, I, di- I didn't go and talk to him. I didn't know him. I didn't. Somehow the setting just didn't. It was sort of an ICU area. It didn't feel like I really should walk in there. But uh, every time we ever went there, uh, there was never anybody seeing this guy. And after a while, I got the sense that nobody. He, he probably was one of these guys that just don't have anybody. And um, I don't know if, if he had the Lord or not. If he did, you know, th- that that would have been good. I don't know if he did or not. But it sure made me think: What would it be like for? Uh, someone to be getting old or getting sick, going through all these things, approaching death, and if you didn't have anybody, and especially if you didn't have the Lord, how terrible that would be. And here it says, there's not going to be any more mourning or crying or pain. Uh, he who sits on the throne said, behold, I'm making all things new. And again, the already and the not yet. I mean, every one of us in Christ has already been made new. There's a newness to our life. And, and yet there's going to be things made new in a way that's definitively different than right now. But yet, if you're a Christian, you know in your heart you've been made new. And, and you know as a Christian that you have, the, uh, you have that old sinful flesh that's just hanging on and fighting you. And you have that new part of you, that new creation that so desperately wants to follow Christ. Isn't that true? And it seems like sometimes you're just... The, the wind's blowing at your back and you're sailing along nicely and you're following Jesus and, and other times it seems like you're struggling and the, the sin nature is like a, a wild beast just pinning you down. I mean, doesn't it seem that way? It, 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 there's this fight and Paul talks about in Romans 7 that I do what I don't want to do and I, I don't do what I want to do. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And so... In a sense, there's a newness already, no doubt about it, but when Christ returns, all things will be made new definitively and for eternity. And then the Lord says, and he said, write for these things are faithful and true. These, these words are faithful, they're true, they were written by Christ himself. John wrote them, but he penned them by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Verse 6, then he said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I'll give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. When Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, he's saying he, he, dwells, he indwells eternity. You know, no beginning, no end. He is God the Son. And here he freely offers. He says, I'll give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. The, the Lord offers eternal life for all who will come to him. And it's without cost because it's already been paid for. Christ paid the price. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he'll be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable, abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And when, when he makes this list, this is an incomplete list, but what it's really talking about is those who are unrepentant. They're unbelieving. <clears throat> they're living a life that's uh, abominable in the Lord's eyes. They're, they're Murderers, immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, liars, all these things and more. Bottom line is, is those who have rejected Christ and following their own way and not following the Lord. The Bible says there, it's talking about the new heaven and the new earth, but there is a, there's another alternative too, and that's the lake that burns with fire. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke to me, saying, Come here, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And that's the church. That's the church. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Again, this is symbolism. This is symbolism. 
you know, parts of Revelation, it's, it's actually hard to read Revelation and keep your mind disciplined enough to, to realize you're reading symbolism. And sometimes when you're reading it, it's easy to start reading it like it's narrative. And you've got to remember the whole book is symbolism. And so when it says he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, when, when John in the spirit has this vision of uh, Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, it, it's, a, it's a vision, but it stands for something. And the Jerusalem, the holy city, uh, is another picture of the church. The bride is a picture of the church. And so these things are a picture of the church. And, and it says in verse 11, having the glory of God. And so the church has the glory of God. The church is robed uh, in the righteousness of Christ. The church is indwelt by God the Son himself, by the Holy Spirit. And so it has the glory of God. Uh, the church is the most amazing thing there is on this whole earth. And this is the bride of Christ. It's It's amazing. Um, having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. Now the, the symbolism, some parts of Revelation, the symbolism is pretty easy and some parts are more difficult. I find verse chapter 21, I find it to be more difficult. Uh, other people maybe wouldn't, but some of it, I mean, you can kind of figure it out. It, it, I mean, it, some of it's pretty straightforward, but not all of it. I'll, I'll show you what I mean when I get further but it had a great and high wall with 12 gates. And so you think of a great wall, a high wall. You think about the church, the, the now and the future. Uh, the now part, the church has a great and a high wall. It has 12 gates. When you think about uh, the 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, you think about these 12 gates. And, and again, when we think of the number 12, we we, we go right to the apostles, don't we? We go right to the 12 tribes of Israel. And so whenever you think of 12 or 12 times 12, 144, when you think of those numbers, it just brings you to the church, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. And so here's these 12 gates, and it's just similar. This is the church. And 12 gates, why 12 gates? Why so many gates? Again, the, the number 12 is symbolic, but just even having a lot of gates. The church itself... Um, and again, you guys keep thinking this is symbolic of now and future. Part of it's now, part of it's future. Right now, when we think about the 12 gates, it just says there's a lot of entries into the church. Churches open up to the world and say, come in. Drink of the water of life freely. And so that's, it's not like, I mean, there's, there's a lot of openings. It's like the, the church is here inviting the world to come in. And yet at the same time, there's 12 angels at the gates. And names are written on them. Uh, which are the names of the, uh, it, well, here it says, and at the t gates 12 angels, and names are written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. 12 angels, you think about, you know, what are angels doing at the gates of this uh, heavenly Jerusalem? And, you know, there, there's uh, William Hendrickson, what he says, that, that the symbolism would mean that the 12 angels are, are guarding and uh, guarding from any evil coming in. And again, it's just a picture, it's a vision. But uh, in, in the church, uh, the, the now church, right now, the militant church on the earth, uh, we, we have gates, so to speak. We want people to come in. And at the same time, at the same time, um, when, when someone actually becomes a part of the church, uh, when, when they've actually joined the church, we... We want people in our church, and, mo and many churches are like this, we want them to give a profession of Jesus Christ. And we want them to be able to, to, to really say, I have accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. We, we want to see those people either having, have, have, having baptized or getting baptized because baptism is, this, is the outward symbol of the spiritual reality of a, I'm joining myself to Jesus Christ. Um, I'm, I'm coming into that water. I'm coming to Christ. I'm... As I go into that water, I'm dying to my old self and leaving my old self behind. And, it's like, and, I'm, and I'm joining Christ in his death and his burial. And when I come out of those waters, I'm rising in Jesus Christ as a new creation, leaving the old behind. Behold, new creation. And, and, and I've left the old behind, and now I'm in Christ, walking with Christ. And that baptism is a, is a symbolic, the sim, outward symbolism for the conversion of a sinner to a saint. 
Okay, and so these 12 angels there, it, it, you, you, could, you could see that as a, uh, I mean, we don't know for sure, but we could certainly see the 12 angels guarding the gates. While there's gates to come in, there's angels guarding and saying, we, we want people coming in who are truly coming to Christ. Um, <clears throat> verse 13, there were three gates on the east and three gates on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And, and, and so you think of northeast, southwest, the, the, the invitation to come to Christ is, is every direction worldwide. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And so we see that the, the names of the apostles, we see the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, so we see Old Testament, we see New Testament. And so this heavenly Jerusalem that's a picture of the church is talking about the church of the Old and the New Testament, the church of all time. Uh, all God's people for the whole age. And the wall of the city had, um, <clears throat> number 15, the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square and its length is as great as the width and he measured the city with the rod 1,500 miles. So what, was, what was that again? Is it 12,000? 12,000 furlongs. And, and, and that's going to be what's accurate because the 1,500 miles they they converted the twelve thousand furlongs into miles, and I don't, I just I don't know. It's easy to start uh, losing your symbolism in Revelation and start thinking in a narrative sense. Even the translators must have did it, because it's certainly not meant to be fifteen hundred miles. It's meant to be twelve thousand furlongs, because the numbers are symbolic, and there's nothing symbolic about fifteen hundred miles. But there is something symbolic about twelve thousand furlongs. Twelve again, the number of the church. You know, the 12 apostles, and you think times a 1,000. And just like the 1,000-year millennium, or the 144,000, <clears> that 1,000 stands for a number that's huge. So uh, <clears throat> 1,500 miles, uh, the 12,000 furlongs, its length is width, its height are equal. Um, the, the, again, the symbolism. And then we see the... Um, the fact that it's square, its length, its width, width its height is equal. This, um, if we go back into the Old Testament and we see the tabernacle out in the wilderness, they had, and, and the tabernacle, the temple, once they built it, it was the same way. You would, you would walk in there, well, you, you and I wouldn't walk in there, but the, the high priest would walk in there. And there, what was, there was what was called the holy place, and then there was a, a veil, and then there was the Holy of Holies. And in the holy place, they brought uh, offerings every single day. There was a table for what they called the showbread. There was the lamps that, that were to be continually burning. There was these different, uh, the, let's see what else was in there. I know those two things were in there. The high priest would go in there and he'd make sure the showbread was in place, the lamps were lit and so on. He would do all these things and this was a daily thing that they did. But only once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies. And when he did, he had to have incense burning and he had to bring the, the, the uh, sacrificial blood in there for himself and then the sacrificial blood uh, for all of Israel. And inside the Holy of Holies was the, the Ark of the Covenant. And um, they actually, that, it, was, it was a holy place, and while God is omnipresent, yet there was in a special sense when God said he, he was there. And the, the, the high priest was not even to look on the Ark he had to have the, the smoke burning from the incense. And, and when the high priest would go into the uh, Holy of Holies, possibly even in the holiest place, but for sure the Holy of Holies, they, uh, tradition, uh, I've read in, in history that they actually would have a, a rope tied around the priest. And, they, and you can read in the Old Testament of how there was little bells around his robe and so when he was moving you could hear the bells and if the bells stopped ringing um, they had something to pull him out with meaning he did something and like looked on the ark or did something and he and he died and <clears throat> they couldn't go in there to get him and so the, it, was, it was a holy holy place well what's interesting when it says here the 
city is laid out as a square and its length is as great as the width and he measured the city with the rod and anyways it says its length and width and height are equal. The holy of holies was the length and the width and the height were equal. And so the symbolism here is this whole city is like the holy of holies. God is there dwelling and and we have access to it. The veil's been torn, torn in half. And so that's interesting. But even now there's a sense of that already because all of us as Christians are considered priests and we have access to God himself. And so in a sense this is happening right now. But in a way when we're, when we're in heaven it will be even, even more so. And he measured its wall. Here, I, I said, do we go through this here? I'm going through the whole thing all again. I hope you guys are okay with a little review. This is probably more than review, but... He measured this wall, and it was how many cubits? 144, wasn't it? 12 times 12. Old Testament, New Testament. According to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. The, now, here's the part where... Um, it's easy to get into the um, narrative interpretation, like literal narrative versus symbolism. But if you remember it's a symbol, okay, then you think, okay, this is symbolism. It's a vision. But there's sometimes you can make sense of the vision. In fact, a lot of times you can, but sometimes it's hard. And so for this part, for me anyway, when it says the material of the wall was jasper and the city was pure gold like clear glass, foundation stones were adorned with every kind of precious stone. And then it lists off these different stones. It, I, I think it would be one of those things like, what does the jasper mean? What does the sapphire mean? What does the chalcedony mean? And someone could just, uh, I mean, that would be really overdriving the headlights. I think the whole idea is just to get a picture of this in your mind of the beauty. I think that's what it is. I, I, I just think that's what it is. I could be wrong, but I, I think that's what it is because... How would you know what a sardonyx stands for or, a, or an amethyst or anything? But when you picture this whole thing, you really see some beauty. And, and so I, I think it's just, this is a beautiful city. And again, well, what is this beautiful city? It's a beautiful, it's God's beautiful church, his beautiful people. And that's what it's standing. I mean, this, here's a city described, but the city, the, the, this vision, this is the church. And so... You picture this beauty being described. This is God's people. This is the church. And that's pretty neat. Twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I saw no temple in it for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God has illumined it. And its lamp is the Lamb. And so this is the brilliance of, of, of the Lord the Bible talks about the Lord being uh, a light in him. There's no darkness. Yes. Well, I think it certainly could be because the, the, the holy city it, it is the church. And, and it, it might not even be to individuals, but, but us collectively as a church that this is yeah, it's precious to God. Yeah, that's that's I am I'm really quite sure that what it, that it means that or something very similar, because the uh, the holy city is the church and it's, be, it's being described in terms of very precious stones, great beauty, lustrous beauty, and 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 it's this holy city coming down out of heaven and it's just meant to be described as just something just brilliant beyond what we can even imagine and and this is this is God's picture of us the church. Yeah, that's really something, isn't it? Yeah, so that, I think that's what it is. I really do. Um, there's no need of sun or moon to shine on it. The glory of God's illumined it. The Bible says that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. You know, 1 John 1, 5. And so the nations will walk by its light. Now, here, here's something interesting. Again, this seems to be talking about the church now and the church of the future. Kind of. And they really are, in a sense, the same, because this very church, these very people, us, and all of Christians, we will be the same people glorified in heaven someday. So, I mean, it is, it is now, and it is not yet simultaneously. Here's a part that sounds like the already now, 
when, it, when it's saying the nations will walk by its light. You know, the nations walking by the light of God's church, even in the earth. I mean, there's a rebellion against the church, and yet, uh, I mean, this, this United States was founded uh, on Christian principles, no doubt about it. And, and the, the nations, our nation, uh, any nation that's had uh, the Christianity in it has had the privilege of walking by the light of that church, at least to a point. It definitely influences every single nation where the church has ever been. There's no doubt about it. It's, we are a light on a hill. We are a light in a dark place. There's no doubt about it. The church influences the nations. So the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. And in a sense, that's the now and the future. And they'll bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And that's talking about the future church. But even now, as a church, we want to not bring the unclean, the abominations into the church. We, you know, all of us are imperfect. All of us are still sinners and saints at the same time. And yet, by God's grace, we we don't want to we don't want to bring in we don't want to bring in something that's an abomination, something unclean into the church. I mean, all of us will do things that are wrong. But what I mean by that is, we want to be teaching and preaching the pure word of God and practicing to the best we can with God's help what God's word says. We don't want to bring something in in the sense like say, okay, here's something that the, the, the Bible forbids, but you know what, we're going to be okay with that, Bring in something in. And some churches have done that, and we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. Now look at verse uh, chapter 22. <clears throat> then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life bearing fruit. 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him. They will see his face. Wow, that's amazing. And his name will be on their foreheads, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. Let me just uh, back up and go over these verses again, over these verses. When it says, Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. We think of the water, um, <clears throat> the, the, the water of life. This is a, okay, so you imagine it's a vision. There's this river, this water of life. It's clear. It's crystal. It's coming from the throne of God and, and of the Lamb. And so you think, what, is this, what does this mean? Here's a vision. Here's, here's the throne of the Lamb, throne of God, and this clear water coming from it. And you think, um, the water of life, you think the offer of eternal life. And where does it come from? It comes from God. It comes from Christ. And, 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 you, and, you, and you look at this water, um, it's clear. And... Uh, we look at uh, Psalm 19, I believe it's Psalm 19. It says the, the word of the Lord is pure. Let me just look this up real quick. Yeah, so we see this uh, Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise is simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They're righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. 
sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. So we see all this stuff in the Bible. It talks about the word of the Lord being pure and, and clean and perfect, restoring the soul. And here we see this picture of this river of life, clear as crystal, coming out of the throne. And you see that water, you, can, you see that clean, that clear water, and that, that's a, that you can see that as, a, as, as a, the water of life. Well, what, 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 is it, what is it standing for coming from the throne? is the offer of eternal life, the gospel. Okay, the, it, it is the word of God. And so it's, there's just a, again, if you're, if you're going by this as being a vision in which I, I, it, it's, it's so easy to jump into actually thinking a throne and this river coming out of it. It's just, it's so natural to do that. I actually find it harder at the end of this book than at the other places. This part I start visioning, you know, imagining this is how it actually is, but this is a vision still. So when you think about this clear, pure, perfect water coming out of the throne, it's called the water of life. Jesus says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so think of it in those ways, that that river of life, that water of life, is uh, it's the word of God. It's the offer of eternal life. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And on either side of the river was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit. Again, that symbolism of 12, we think of the church, yielding its fruit every month. In the leaves of the trees for the, for the healing of the nations. Again, this is, this is talking about the, the church of God, the heavenly, the heavenly city, the bride of Christ, and it's talking about it's already here, and it's going to be in glory. It's the church militant, then the church triumphant. There's already a part right now that the, that the tree of life, the tree of life is going to be restored in heaven, and yet there's a sense of the you know, I, when I start thinking about this stuff, it just gets me. I have, I think, it's become. A, I'm becoming an old man. I cry easy. The, the 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 tree of life bearing fruit, healing the nations. What is that tree of life? You know, when we think of the tree of life, we think of um, the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, and rightly so. But there's more to it than that. Tree of life. Christ hung on a tree. So what's the tree of life? It's the cross. Christ hung on that cross. And the tree of life, the cross, is for the healing of the nations. Isn't that true? When you think about that, it's this amazing thing to think about. I shouldn't have took a nap. I'm too tired, and I cry too easy. I just cry too easy. This stuff just, it hits your heart, though, doesn't it? Doesn't that just hit your heart? The tree of life, the tree of life, it's, uh, it's amazing. And so, um, bearing its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There'll no longer be any curse, okay? Where did that curse go? The tree of life. Jesus took our curse. No more curse. And the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him. And so, you know, again, the already, the not yet. The church is already here. The church will be in heaven. It will be glorified, but it's already here. It's both. And so there's no longer any curse now for us. Right now, there's no longer. Jesus took the curse on the tree, on the tree of life. And it's for the healing of all of us. Uh, and then it says, and his bondservants will serve him. Then they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And Christian his name is already on your foreheads. Remember we, remember we looked at the, at the seal, God put his seal. In Revelation, we see how God put his seal on our, on our foreheads. It's there. And we see, well, what does that mean? We look at Ephesians 1.13, and it says that he sealed us by the Holy Spirit of, of promise. He sealed us for the day of redemption. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit already. And so we have that name already on our foreheads. But here we're going to see his face. Now we see his face through faith. He's really here among us, but we're going to see his face with our eyes. There will no longer be any night. They will not have need of the light of a lamp or the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them. They'll reign forever and ever. And so um, no longer any night. And I think that that's symbolic. In the, I mean, there, there really might not be any night. I, I, I don't know. 
how heaven's going to actually be in that sense. Most likely, that this, it probably won't be any night at all, but, but for sure there will no longer be any night in the sense of, of that darkness. But we'll have the light. Uh, 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 we'll have the light of, of God illuminating us, and and you know, even now, even now, even in the night, when you're in your bedroom and you turn on a lamp, and you're reading the Bible, and you're and you're and you're meditating on God's word, and you're right there communing with God, in a very sense, very real sense, there's you're enlightened, aren't you? In a very real sense, there's no darkness, even in the dark with a lamp on, because. Because God is light. But there there'll be, we'll have the very light of God. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And so they are, they're faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And so these things are going to, they're going to take place and they're going to take place soon. And part of it, part of it, the, the already part, the church started taking off even right there. In, in, in the already not yet things I've been talking about, the already part were taking place immediately. The churches began, and God was tabernacling on the earth in his church among men. And, and, and so a lot of these things are happening even right now, and yet there's a part that's in glory that hasn't happened yet. But so don't think of all this stuff as just, this is all future. When, when that angel said, this must soon take place, Parts of these things and the, how they're fulfilled on the earth were already beginning to take place. The, the holy city come down from heaven and it has its gates and we're opening it up to the world and, and there was a healing of the nations already beginning to take place. And so these things have been happening this whole time, this whole church age. And yet there's going to be a, a very definitive change when Christ returns. So think about when it says soon take place. It's taking place right now. Some of it's taking place has been taking place through the whole church age. And then this is the words of Jesus, and behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Christ is coming. He's coming quickly. Um, if someone would say that, well, it's been 2,000 years, well, uh, Christ has already come into his church. He set up his kingdom on the earth, and he's been on the white horse going through history, as we've talked about all through the church age, he's already come in that sense. He's here right now. He's in our hearts. He's dwelling with us. And so he's already come. And yet he's coming quickly in the sense that he's going to come in glory and we're going to see him and it's going to be the end of the world. And if someone says, well, 2,000 years, well, he's been here the whole time. But if they're saying, well, it's been 2,000 years, if they're referring to the actual second coming of Christ, even that, how long is 2,000 years in the light of eternity? The Bible says the a thousand years is as a day, you know, and a day is as a thousand years to the Lord. And so the Lord's coming quickly. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. You know, John was so amazed. I mean, John was the beloved disciple. John was the one who lay his, his head on Christ's chest at the Last Supper. He was the one who was young. The, the other apostles were just grown men, but they believed that John might have been just a young, like a teenager. And so they all, they all took care of him. They protected him. He was the beloved disciple. And here he was, and now he was an old man. And he was a Christian, and a solid Christian all the days of his life. And, and, and here he is. He, he's so amazed by this angel, and he's so amazed by these visions that he actually fell down to worship at the feet of the angel. And it wasn't because John was a, uh, meaning to do something simple or wrong. He was just so amazed that he, he was bowing down. In, in, I think in the sense of the worship at the feet of the angel, it was, it was more of a reverence and an amazing thing. Um, I, I, I don't think it meant like a betrayal of Jesus as much as more he was in awe. And yet that angel told him, uh, do not do that. Do not do that. I'm a fellow servant, just like you. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets and of those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. So even though he, he, was, uh, he was just, he was amazed by what he went through. He just was. And, but he still needed to be corrected. Even John in his old age is a mature and 
very wise Christian apostle. He needed to be corrected in that. Um, well, look at verse 10. How are we doing? We're doing good. Um, I'll go a few more minutes, then we'll take a little break, okay? And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who is here say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy of this, words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Okay, so, <clears throat> verse 10. And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. And, and so John was not to seal up this book. He was to, 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 to write it, to print it, to preach it, to get it out there. And then it says, for the time is near. Again, there's that urgency. There's a sense of the time is near that Christ is going to return. And in, uh, in light of eternity, it's always been near. We don't know exactly when it's coming, but the time is near. But there's another sense, that, and they might not mean this by what they're writing here, but there still is another thing to think about. There is a, there's a sense that the time is really truly near for every human being who's ever been on this planet because we don't live that long. And... Uh, even if Christ doesn't return, let's say Christ came 2,000 years ago and his second coming isn't for you know 2,000 some years, every single Christian, every single person that's lived during this whole period, they've only lived 70, 80, 90 years, and uh, sometimes much shorter. And so the time is near for every one of us. Um, when we will, if Christ doesn't return, we'll go to him. And so the, the, there's just this, this life is, is, is short. It's, it just is short. And, and so it says, in, in light of the fact that Christ is returning soon, let the one who does wrong still do wrong. And the one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. And the one who is holy still keep himself holy. And that's an interesting thing to say. Uh, let the one who does wrong still do wrong. It's like, it's like we need to be concerned about the glory of God. And while we are to evangelize and to be ambassadors on this earth, it's the, the urgency of this message, uh, Christ is coming and be ready and so on. It's like, okay, if someone is not going to listen to you, if someone is not going to follow Jesus, so let the one who does wrong still do wrong, keep going. It's kind of like saying that kind of a thing. Yeah. Uh, one of the arguments against a future millennium, and you guys are all familiar with the idea of a future millennium, probably. Um, one of the interpretations is, is that, the, that there's the church age, and then there's a seven-year period of tribulation, and then, then the, the, the world goes into a thousand-year millennium where Christ is reigning on the earth, and there's a thousand years before the final judgment. And in that millennium, uh, those who survive the tribulation, those who are Christians and have not died, they go right directly into the millennium in their flesh and blood. And those who are glorified saints come back with Christ and they're in the millennium. And so you have this thousand years on the earth with glorified saints and those who are in flesh and blood who are Christians, they start to have children. Their children are still born with sinful flesh. And then over a thousand years, there ends up being a 
whole lot of people who are um, wicked, evil people that reject Christ and and Christians and people in glorified bodies. And that's something that w- when you think about a millennium, that, that with Christ reign, it, it's it it just doesn't really fit very well with Scripture. Um, I'm saying that kindly. I think it doesn't fit at all with Scripture. Uh, Christ says there'll be no flesh in my presence. And he's talking about, you know, in the heavenly state when we're glorified. Those who are glorified, there's going to be no flesh and blood in their presence. There's going to be no more sin, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain. If you're in a glorified body, living on this earth with people who are sinful people who you know, now all, all, you've been glorified. All your sinful, sinful flesh is gone. We're, we're going to be in a way where we can't even imagine. We're going to have the holiness of Christ in, in a way that we can't even imagine. Our bodies are going to be glorified. We're not going to be any longer uh, in the presence of sin. And so that, to imagine a millennium where Christ is there and we're in glorified bodies, and yet there's people who would curse Christ, people who hate Christ, people who would reject Christ right in our midst, dealing with that while we're in a glorified state. It doesn't match up with Scripture. It just doesn't match up. And so, I, 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 and, and if you understand the uh, symbolic way of interpreting, this, this is just a symbolic literature, if you understand that the thousand years makes perfect sense, as we've already talked about, that it went from the cross to the end of the world. So this idea of um, let one who does wrong still do wrong, it's talking about right now. Yeah. Just the idea that, you know, when you think about going to heaven, I mean, when, yeah, when we go to heaven, the Bible says uh, when, when, you know, our bodies are decaying, the outer man is decaying every day, but the inner man is being renewed every day. And, and the Bible talks about that when, uh, when we're absent from the body, we'll be present with the Lord. And in the presence of the Lord, Psalm, uh, Psalm 1611, I think, I think Psalm 1611 says, in your presence is joy forever. And, and there's going to be a joy forever. We're going to be in the very presence of God. We're going to see him face to face. We're going to be with the glorified saints. There's going to be no sin. And we think of all that kind of stuff going on in heaven right now. During the millennium, it says that the saints right now are reigning with Christ for a thousand years. Okay, and so this is this perfect glory. It's just amazing. Beyond eye has not seen, ears not heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Paul said that he saw sights. He heard things that... that, he, that well, when he came back, 2 Corinthians 12, I believe it is. I believe it is. I think it is. But you can find it if you want to find it. But when he came back from, he, he, he was taken up to the third heaven. And when he came back, the, the sights he saw, the things he heard were so amazing that Christ had to put a thorn in his flesh all the days of his life on this earth just to, just to keep him in a place of humility, to keep him in a place where he could even keep on functioning as a human being, uh, preaching the gospel. And so, I mean, heaven is that glorious. It's beyond, the Bible says, we can't even imagine it. And so, you think about these saints up there reigning with Christ right now, and it's going to, when Christ returns and, and all the saints are there and our bodies are resurrected, and then we have glorified bodies, it's even going to be even greater. Right now, it's the, the, the theologians call it the intermediate state, and, and it's going to actually even be greater. And so, it was already so great that Paul had to have a thorn in his flesh. So, so think about this. If it's, if it's that, just the splendor of heaven right now, the glory of heaven, the, amaz- the amazing, uh, I, I don't, whatever English word that I don't even know that would attempt to describe heaven and fall short, that's how heaven is now. And, and when Christ returns and our bodies are glorified, it will be that much greater so can you imagine with all that going on and then bringing those saints to the earth to live among sinners and, and to live uh, in, a, in a place where after a thousand years that Satan would gather his people against the camp of the saints and, and then Christ would destroy them? I mean, to me, it biblically doesn't even compute. This doesn't even compute. But I want to say it nicely because if, because there's people who just won't agree with me and I don't want to come across like mean or arrogant or condescending or anything like that. I don't mean that. People hold to that view. But I, I just, I just, I, I believe in this, this old, very old view that was, uh, it's been around for centuries 
And I think it, it fits Scripture better. When, when, we, when we leave this earth, when we leave the church militant and enter the church triumphant, it will be triumphant, and it will be triumphant forever. We're not coming back to this. When we, when we come back to the earth, here's when we're going to come back to the earth. It's 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, when it says, when the Lord returns, he's going to come like a thief in the night, and the heavens and the earth are going to be burned up, and they're going to be renewed, and there's going to be judgment day, and the earth will be completely renewed, and, and, and heaven will be on earth, and we will live there in glory forever. And we're not going to be dealing with any more sin. It's done. The Lord rescued us from sin. He saved us from sin. He came to save sinners, not to bring us back to sinners. And, and, and so there's going to be a glory when we leave this earth. And so the, I, 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 just, uh, I just don't believe in that interpretation. I, I don't think it's true. And so uh, anyways, I'll keep going here. I'm just not very structured on a Sunday night, am I? Um, that's why I have manuscripts on Sunday morning. Keep me right where I'm supposed to be. Um, and so John was told to not seal up the prophecy of this book. He said, let the one who does wrong still do wrong. Do wrong. Let, let the one who's filthy still be filthy. It's like uh, Jesus said, don't throw your pearls before swine. It's like tell people about Jesus, but if someone is rejecting Jesus, I mean, pray for them. But let the one, who's, the one who does wrong still do wrong and is saying that because Christ is coming. Christ is coming soon. And so you keep moving and you spread the word. You tell people about Jesus and, and you live for Christ yourself. And the one who's righteous still practice righteousness. And the one who's holy still keep himself holy. Behold. What does that word behold mean? It means look, behold, pay attention. And Jesus is saying behold. I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he's done. The judgment day is coming. Christ is bringing his rewards with him. It's not only that we're saved, but the Lord's even bringing rewards. And then he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. That's a declaration of the deity of Christ. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. They're the very words of God the Father, who, who also says, I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The alpha and the omega, the alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet, and the omega is the last letter. And so by saying, uh, I am the complete word, I'm no beginning, no end. Yes? I just looked at the word. You, 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 you could read it that way. You sure could. If, if, you, if you take that every man to mean every man, then that reward would be, could go both ways because it's the judgment. And I think to, and I think though the, the, the meaning that's more, I mean, you're right, because that's implied there. Yeah, and I, I think, though, the, the, the more important thing that Jesus is trying to say here is when he says, uh, uh, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man uh, according to what he's done. I, I think he, he's sort of emphasizing the fact that the rewards for those who have followed Christ. I th think that's what his emphasis is. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And so Christ is coming again, and he's bringing with him his rewards. And it says, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Now, we look at this and there's uh, wash their robes. So what does that mean? Um, William Hendrickson, when, when he talks about this, um, I think he's got an interesting interpretation on it. He talks about the robes being our character. And he talks about washing them through repentance. And uh, that, that certainly is one way that you could say we wash our robes by over and over, coming back to Christ. Just He never leaves us. Our sins are forgiven. We're justified. But there's a way that we, we continue as we sin to wash our robes before the Lord. Um, they, the other thing is when we think about robes, um, we are going to be in the white robes of Christ. We already are in the sense that we're justified. We're going to stand before Christ, 144,000 in their robes of white singing. We already have seen that. Um, so this is a, this this one here. Uh, I think I, I kind of agree with what William Hendricks is saying here because this isn't talking about the the white robes that we're going to receive, but just the washing and. Um, there's a washing of the water of the word. There's a washing in repentance. 
And so, any way you look at it, uh, I, I'm being a little fuzzy on it because it's 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 a little it's a it's, some of these things are a little tougher to understand, but there certainly is. Martin Luther said the life of a Christian is daily repentance. And would you agree with that? I think it's true, isn't it? And so there's a the washing of the robes, the daily repentance. That's how William Hendricks has interpreted it. So they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Um, and, and, and this is, you know, a, a person who, we're, when you read these phrases, you want to connect it to all of what Scripture says. Uh, scripture is saying that we, the reason that we have the right to the uh, the gates of the city, the reason we can enter the gates of the city is is really because of the tree of life, because of what Jesus did on the tree of life, because of the cross. And he's, he's the one who's even given us repentance. And so um, it said, outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. Again, the already and the not yet. The already in the church, here we have the church and, and we wash our robes through repentance and we have the right to the tree of life. We, 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 we've come to the tree of life. The Lord saved us. We've entered into this city here now. And outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the immoral persons. And then there's a sense of already, but also not yet. When, when we're in heaven itself and we're in the white robes of righteousness and outside in the lake of fire. That's where it'll be the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. And when they say the dogs, that was a, that was a derogatory term for uh, people who were committing immorality. It's not talking about dogs there, like dogs, you know. Um, I'm glad because I like my dog. Um, but it, it's, it, they mean dogs in a, in a different sense. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. So when John got all these visions, when he was told to write this down, this angel came to him, gave him the visions, told him the things to write down, worked in him and through him. This angel is there, well, it's Christ working in and through him, but this angel was there telling him these things, and, and it says, Jesus, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel. It was Jesus who sent this angel to him to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. And so when he says, I am the root of David, I am the descendant of David, he's saying I'm the root of David in the sense I, I, am, I am the Lord. I created all things. David came from me. I'm the root of David. And yet I'm the descendant of David because I became a man. And I, and I came into that David's line. So he's saying, I am God and I am man. I'm the root of David and I'm the descendant of David. And that's an interesting way, way to say it. The bright morning star. And so uh, Jesus is that the bright morning star. Uh, I, 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 I guess, you know, he is, he is uh, I, I'm not quite sure. There's probably quite a few ways of understanding that, but I, I guess we, we just, we look to him. He's the, I know navigators looked at stars for direction. There's different ways that people have looked at this, but he, I, I don't even have to over, I, I just think I don't want to, try to figure that one out. I'm not sure what, what exactly they meant by that. Just Jesus said, I am the bright morning star. I think I, think I would prefer to look at it in a simplistic way that it means just look at me. I'm the bright morning star. Look to me. And that's how I see it. And I don't know what if it means any more than that or not, but Jesus says he is the bright morning star. Like the darkness has left, the morning has come, and I am the bright morning star. Look to me. I think it means something like that. That makes sense to you guys? Um, the Spirit and the Bride says, come. Well, who's the Spirit? Who's the Bride? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Bride, that's the church. The Spirit and the Bride, the Holy Spirit and the church itself says, come. And so the, the Spirit of God is working among the world, and the church itself is saying, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. And let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. I testify to everyone who hears the words. Well, backing up a little bit, the Holy Spirit and the church right now, that very work that's going on is we are saying to anyone who's thirsty, come to Christ. And there's no cost. Yeah, Jesus was called the star, and it said there'd be a star coming out of Bethlehem. 
the, the scepter shall not leave Judah. Um, that, that, that was a prophecy about the, the coming Christ, and, he, and it said a star will come. And, and there was a star above his birthplace, and, and, and now he's called the bright morning star. So definitely have a reference to that too. Amen. That's a good point too. So there's a lot of possibilities, isn't there? But they're positive things. They're the, the bright and the morning star, even the very, you know, the bright, the morning um, star. Yeah, you can see that morning, you can see that star in the daytime, you see that star at nighttime, uh, the bright and the morning star. So, yeah, it's a, defi- it's, it's a reference to Christ. And so the, the next part talks about the Holy Spirit and the bride, the church itself, is inviting people to come to Christ. And that's, our, that's what we're called to do right now while we're here in this world. We're to invite people to come to Christ. Verse 18, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. And so this is a strong warning to not add to this book and to not take away from this book. We've got to be careful to, when you read Scripture, there's verses that are less clear and there's verses that are more clear. And so you want to read verses that are less clear or ambiguous in light of the more clear verses. That's just one of the principles of hermeneutics, one of the principles of Bible interpretation. And so when we look at a verse like that and we, and we see, does that mean that, that if someone takes away from this book, that God is going to erase his name from the book of life? Is, is he going to erase the effects of the tree of life? In other words, could he lose his salvation? And there's, there's actually so many verses that speak against that, that, that I think that we got to be careful on a verse like this to not read that into it. When it says, if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book, I think it's a, it's a strong warning, but the very warnings keep people from doing things, and the very warnings will keep those who are truly saved from doing those things. It's, it's, it's like, uh, in, in other words, while there's a very real warning here, it, still no one's going to lose their salvation if they were really saved. Now let me explain that just a little bit. In the book of Acts, there's a, Paul's on a ship. And he's out at sea. He's in a storm. And um, everyone thinks they're going to lose their lives. You guys remember that? Let's go to 2718. All right. Okay, look at, look at 279 for a minute. Okay, this, this is all going to tie in to Revelation here in just a moment, okay? Look at 27.9. It says, When considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them and said to them, Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss. Okay, now they had been going through this storm already and for a good many days, and they, I mean, it was, it was really getting dangerous. It was really getting bad. Um. And he says, man, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, but not, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. Because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, the majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there. So here, they, it's going to be dangerous. Paul saying it's going to be dangerous, but they go anyway. All right, now... Uh, look at verse 14. But before very long, they rushed down from the land, a violent wind called Euroquilo. And when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. They, they, they had to pull down the sails. They had to just give way to the wind. Or it would have, they had a capsized. It was just such a strong wind. Running under the shelter of a small island called Clotta, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. After they had hoisted up, they... They used supporting cables in undergirding the ship, and fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of Sirtis, they let down the sea anchor, and in this way, let themselves be driven along. The next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm was assailing us, 
From then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. When they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in the midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night, an angel of God, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood before me, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe, God, that, that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on a certain island. So Paul hears from God, you will be saved. You will be saved. And every man on the ship will be saved. Okay? Already a done deal, right? Now look what happens next. But when the 14th night came, as we were being driven out in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. They took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And a little farther on, they took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms. Fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. But as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. Now think about that. Paul said... There will be no loss of life. You'll all be saved. And then he gave this warning and he said, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. How can that even be? He said on one hand, you're, you're absolutely saved. You must appear in Rome and God has granted the lives of these men. It's, it's a done deal. And then a little later, they're going to get out of the ship and try to escape in a boat. And Paul says, if you do this, you're going to die. That's interesting, isn't it? So then what happened? Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. They took the warning seriously. They cut the ropes away. And guess what happened? They all lived. And so what happened is God gave a warning. God decreed they would all live. He already decreed it. And then when these people were going to do what God didn't want them to do, he gave them a warning and said, if you do this, you're not going to live. And yet God knew they would live. But the very warning he gave them was real. But it was a warning that he knew these people would take seriously. God caused them to take it seriously. They cut away the ropes. And what God said originally, they would all be saved. They were saved. So God used the very warning to ensure their salvation their safety. And so when we see here in Revelation, if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. We see that Christians are already saved. They're in the boat. They're saved. They're in the ark. God's already said they're saved. But then all of a sudden, some Christian might be thinking, you know, I'm going to be pulling out this book of Revelation, I don't like parts of these books. I'm going to pull this out. And God says, if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life, from the book of life. And all of a sudden, that person who really is saved, that God decreed would be saved and cannot lose their salvation, what happens when he sees this warning? It's like those people in the book of Acts, they cut away the boat. They said, I'm staying on the ship. They're saying, well, I'm taking this warning seriously. I'm not going to mess with this. And they're saved. You see, so no one, no one who is truly saved will ever have their name taken away from the book of life. They'll never be taken away access to the tree of life because every warning that God would give them, because they're God's people and the Holy Spirit lives in them and works in them, the warning will always work. No, no, no saved person will ever be lost just like no one on that ship ever was lost. It doesn't say if anyone interprets this book wrongly because because we could interpret it wrongly, right? But what it is saying is if anyone takes away from the book of this prophecy, okay? So we we don't want to take away. We don't want to diminish from it, nor do we want to add to it. And I think by implication, 
we better be careful about the whole Bible, right? We don't want to take away from the Bible. We don't want to add to the Bible. Yep. And so this is talking about taking away. This is talking about taking away. So, yeah. And so the warning, the warning's real, just like the warning was real in the book of Acts. But everyone heeded the warning, and everyone was saved. And I'm convinced because the rest of Scripture tells me that no one who is truly saved can be lost, that this warning, while it's real, no true Christian can take this warning. Can, can, no two Christian, true Christian is ever going to be lost by disobeying this because God won't lose any of them. Jesus said, I will lose none of them. So just chew on that for a while. <laughs> so... Um, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming quickly, amen. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all, amen. And so he who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming quickly. That's Jesus saying that. He's saying, yes, I'm coming quickly, and he is, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's the response of the church. The Lord says, I'm coming, and we say, Lord, come. Come soon. And, uh, and we, we pray for his second coming, don't we? We pray for his return, and, and we look forward to it. And then it's, it ends so wonderfully. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. So does anybody have any questions? Yes. I think, I think this is a vision. And so, uh, and I think it's an already and not yet. And so if we look at the already and the not yet, the already is right now. The, the New Jerusalem is, is the church there's the, what's called the church militant and the church triumphant. The church militant is those who are still in the battle here on earth. We're in the church militant. Church triumphant is in heaven already. And uh, so the already part is, is right now, uh, the, the, there's, we have the church and, and, and those people are on the outside around in the world, but then in the heaven. Was that, no. See, Abraham and Lazarus was uh, a parable and it was meant to drive a point. And so, I mean, parables, parables have, uh, they're just a, like a story to, to, to tell it, to make a point. And so when it talked about Lazarus uh, being in the flames and, and speaking to Abraham, uh, that was to drive a point of, you know, what, what uh, the, the whole point was if, if, if someone were to even rise from the dead, those people won't believe. So, but as far as uh, there, there's, there's no indication that when it says that they'll be outside of the city, they'll be long ways outside of the city. There's, yeah, there's, yeah, we're not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to see hell. We're not, you're right. Yeah, although, although when, when even, even when we're, when we're in heaven and, and, and we're thinking how, we, we're, we're, we've already been given the mind of Christ in the sense that we, we can understand Scripture and so on, but when there's a, there's a way when we, we don't see, but yet we, then we will fully see, like 1 Corinthians talks about that. Um, when we truly, truly have our sin completely washed away, when we understand the holiness of God, when we, when we, when we, come, when we become that pure and holy ourselves, um, not, not that we'll never become deity, but we will become, we'll have the holiness of Christ. When, when we're there, and, and so that, that we're thinking like God thinks, and we see sin how God sees sin, and we see how this really is, we won't look at hell and think tears. We won't. We'll, we'll, we'll think justice and amen. Like even if we saw our child, we wouldn't be... Right, like Charles Spurgeon. I've told you about that. Yeah, I mean... I, I've, some of you probably heard me say this from the pulpit before, but if you haven't, this might be new to you, but um, it bears repeating. Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers in the 1800s, fantastic preacher, um, he, he had a very wonderful relationship with his mother. He was just one of these blessed children that he just had a wonderful mother, and they had a wonderful relationship, and his mom and dad were Christians. And uh, when Charles Spurgeon was just a child, um, his mom would talk to him and, and read him from the Bible and pray with him and, and uh, read from the Bible with him and pray with him and so on. And one time, I was reading this in, in one of his biographies. It was really interesting. Um, I'm paraphrasing it, but it was the gist of it was this. His mom sat down with him, with his child, Charles, 
and she said, Charles, I, I love you. I love you so much. I love you so dearly. You're my, you're my son. But I want you to know that if you reject Jesus Christ and you're standing before the Lord someday and he says, depart from me, you accursed into the lake of fire reserved for the devil and his angels, I'm going to say amen. Just think how that hit him. I mean, that's his mom told him that, and he always remembered that, and his mom loved him dearly. They had a, just a great relationship all their whole life, but what his mom was doing was really saying, you need Christ, and if you reject Christ, you know, her loyalty to Christ was before her loyalty to her son. Pretty powerful, wasn't it? <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time we could be together, and thank you, Lord, for uh, just for your church. Thank you, Lord, that we're in the fellowship of your son. Thank you, Lord, that we belong to uh, the new Jerusalem, that we are the new Jerusalem, that we are your bride. Thank you, Lord, that you love us like a bride, and you'll never let us go. Thank you, Lord God, that you died for all of our sins, even the sins we don't even know, know about yet, the sins we haven't even committed yet. You know the end from the beginning, and we thank you that you'll just love us that much and that you'll never let anyone snatch us out of your hands. Lord, we thank you for eternal life, for salvation. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your love for us. And we ask and pray, Lord, that you'd just continue to bless Cross Point Church and every Christian here. And help us, Lord, to just uh, go out into the world and be bright lights for you. Uh, Lord, thank you for this time together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for coming out.